All right, we are back with Book of Experts TV, and this is this is kind of a special episode because we're talking with a guest that we had on last week, but we had some technical issues with the audio. You might have seen that. So we had some broken audio, uh, but I didn't want you to miss out on this opportunity to hear this information because you may be in a situation where you have a presentation that really matters, like when it really counts and all the, everything's on the line and you want to level up your game, that's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode of Book of Experts TV. Time for Book of Experts TV. Topics you love. Experts you trust. Friction free referrals. Tried. Tested. Trusted. This is Book of Experts, brought to you by Salesman.me. Luke Getting, welcome back to Book of Experts TV. We're going to dig into this topic again. We're going to give people a double exposure, and we have to because our audio wasn't quite where we wanted it to be the last week, but I wanted to capture this information because I've been in this situation. I know some of our experts out there, you know, when, when the stakes are high, they're presenting to a board of directors. They're sp presenting to what may be the make or break client for your business. There's a lot of a lot riding on that, and that's where you guys come in with Puffing Puffingston presentations. You guys do something unique, and I want to talk about that. I want to talk about first how you got into that business and where you go with it from there. Make sense? Absolutely, and and of course. Uh adapting and, and going with the flow in terms of technical <laughs> considerations is, is all part of the fun of virtual meetings and virtual events. So uh, good thing we experienced it firsthand. Yeah, go, going with the flow is that's like the key skill set these days, right? For all of us, we just we just have to make it work. Um, we last time we talked a little bit about the Puffingston name, it, I, I said it was unique. But I'd like to hear a little bit more. Uh, you told us why you got into this, and I think there's a hook there for others that may be sort of figuring their, where do they fit in this? Is this the right fit for them? Absolutely. So I accidentally came into what I'm doing now professionally. I had been, I had been in outside sales traveling all over the Midwest as a manufacturer's rep, and so I was meeting on a, on a daily basis with our dealer network. And it didn't take long for me to realize that the slideshow that I was sharing at all these meetings was probably the top tool in my arsenal in terms of uh, allowing me to achieve the most success I could in my job, in my role. And so I really started experimenting with different strategies and techniques and ways to, to drive engagement. I really wanted to avoid what uh, I kind of found to be the case, which was a lot of people were coming in from the field because their manager said they had to, had to come to my meetings. I had to be there because my boss was telling me I had to go meet with all my dealers so many times per year. And I really wanted to avoid this just being a check the box type of affair. I really wanted to see how can we best facilitate communication. And so that interest and passion led me ultimately to uh, eventually quit that role and start consulting full time. And about six months into this consulting, which frankly wasn't going super well to that uh, industry that I'd come from, um, but I, one of the prezies that I had created a presentation for that industry ended up winning the Best Business Prezi Award. And uh, from there, my, my uh, consulting kind of morphed into a presentation agency, and we've been helping country companies around the country and around the world create dynamic, high-impact presentations. So in terms of Puffingston, uh, that was the nickname of my baby sister since she was uh, under one year old. We kind of became a family brand. And so when it was time to uh, set up the company, uh, Puffingston was the obvious choice. And of course, it doesn't hurt that all the URLs and social media handles were available. Yeah, totally. So you have, you have a family connection there. And you also have this, you know, we hear this with entrepreneurs over and over again, which is... Uh, I'm going to use a word, that, I'm going to call it near failure, and I only mean that in the sense of things not working out as we had hoped or planned initially, but a lot of times that's that's where we learn, those, those, uh, we accelerate our learning by moving through those cycles where things aren't working out. We make adjustments and we make ourselves much more relevant. Uh, 
relevant to the industry. Luke, for for you, the people that are that are coming to you, let's talk about the the ideal client, the common folks that are that like this is not your everyday PowerPoint presentation. There are special circumstances when you would seek out Puffingston. Let's talk about the not the today because I know it's a little different. We'll get into that as well, uh, the current environment. But what has it traditionally been the best fit for you and the agency? Because I've seen the work. It's it's amazing work that you and the team are doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, we typically work on three types of presentations. We work on high impact executive keynotes. We work on global sales presentations and we work on corporate templates. And so what's neat about that is, is you have some kind of different situations. The executive keynote is a one to many style presentation. Typically there's hundreds, if not thousands in the audience. Whereas a sales presentation is sometimes a very intimate environment, a one-on-one -on -one presentation, which has a different dynamic to it. And then of course, corporate templates are all about how can we create a foundation for a company that essentially affects every time they use a slideshow um, for the year, for multiple years by opening up that template and how can we make it as impactful as possible. So those are the primary presentations we work on. And if something doesn't fit into that category, I was, everything is essentially a sales presentation that you're trying to convince someone to do something. So uh, the rest of them can throw into that sales presentation category. How important are the tools, whether it's you know, PowerPoint or Keynote, you've already mentioned Prezi and I've, I've seen some of the work, I, you know, I think that's one of the eye-catching things because you guys do use some different tools and in unique engaging ways, but how important is the technology and how important is the psychology and how do you guys manage that balance? It's a great question and it's a great insight to explore. I would, I would suggest the technology isn't as important as people, people kind of lean on and, and kind of expect of the technology. A lot of times one of the biggest mistakes, and you'll, you'll hear this commonly from people in the presentation space, a big mistake is just opening up PowerPoint. That's your step one. Hey, I've got a presentation to go and I'm opening up the software and now Microsoft's got this prompt for me to put in a header and some bullet points and I'm off to the races. And of course, by doing that, you, you've foregone a lot of strategy around the message, which is really, really critical. A lot of times we will work in, and build out a full script with the client on a Word document or on um, written out and, and kind of a mind map exercise or, or on a notepad. And so ultimately I look at presentation software as just a simple tech, simple tool that allows you to display information on a full screen and, and then um, advance it forward and backward based on your progression of your, of your talk. And so I think sometimes our tendency is to get so fixated on all the little different features and, and every one of these different presentation softwares. When you go to present mode, other than some very minor differences, PowerPoint, Google Slides, Keynote, Prezi, it's just showing information on a full screen display and allowing you to progress forward. And so um, really getting that message correct and then complementing it with high impact visuals and I really stress the word complement versus we've all seen so many presentations that compete versus complement with what they're trying to say. Um, that's what you should really be fixating on, not getting too engrossed in the software itself. All right, so here's the million dollar question, Luke, because you guys are in the middle of this right now. You, you've had folks use your presentations at big events like South by Southwest, CES, again, when, when there's high stakes and people really need, need to make that positive impression, those events, South by Southwest was canceled uh, for this year. CES, I, we just talked about this on our expert show last week. CES is scheduled to go next year, but there's a lot of speculation about, you know, we don't know with these timelines and all. So what are you doing differently today? How is, how is this event-driven business high stake presentation business changing for you in the agency at Puffingston? Yeah, it's wild to think about South by Southwest, especially we're, we're actually based in Austin. And so the, the impacts of that cancellation ripple throughout the community. And, and it feels like so long ago, but really it was just over three months ago. Um, so as we shift to virtual events, I think there's a lot of interesting considerations. Um, I've been trying to, to start by reminding my clients I think our tendency human nature is to be like, okay, we've got this really new situation and 
we've moved online, we're doing all these meetings virtually, like, it's okay if we're just doing average meetings. We're just trying to kind of make, make buy. And that was perhaps okay for the first few months, but you know, this is essentially the new normal. And I should stress that not all companies were doing you know, fully in-person meetings beforehand. Companies like ours, our, our digital agency, we've been primarily collaborating with clients remotely for the entire seven years we've been in existence. And I think you'll just continue to see, I like to think of it as a slider scale. You've got in-person and you've got virtual events. And I think that slider scale is gonna shift more toward virtual and we have to embrace that. So it shouldn't just be this mentality Hey, this is this is something we have to just get by. We should be really actively seeking ways to to make these meetings successful, and and sometimes I argue better than what in person meetings could be. So um, some simple things I, I like to number one really strategize about your presence. I am a huge fan of a just making sure you are using your webcam when you're trying to have an important trying to execute an important meeting, and then I'm also a huge advocate for standing. So right now I'm using my stand up desk. It's just so much more natural for me to converse. I can gesture. A lot of times you'll see people just sitting at a desk. You never see their hands in the entire meeting. And there's, it's just, just so much easier to be expressive. And so those simple things, um, those are the two things I start with when I'm talking with people about virtual events. And just by doing that, you've got so much closer to emulating the in-person experience that, of course, we take for granted when we're sitting uh, across the table from, from each other. Um, I'll, I'll pause there and then happy to happy to pick up on more uh, through all our chat. I, I want to bring up the I'm going to bring on screen the Puffingston website. Um, you've got a great section with success stories there. There's some great visuals as well um, where where folks can actually see some of these real life events where you've got big stages, big audiences. Uh, it sort of creates that environment, uh, that feel for the environment that you've been working in. How how are you adjusting your thought process? I'm thinking of this in terms of a formula. Maybe that's not the right a formula or a framework of putting together the big impact presentation. How has that shifted in this virtual space? The biggest thing we're emphasizing to our clients is you can't take the audience for granted the way you perhaps did before. And of course, we wouldn't have advocated for that initially either. But in some ways, many times when you're giving the, the presentations that you just showed there, Tobin, those ones you do essentially have a captive audience. They are you know, sitting in a, in a ballroom, the doors are shut, and you the only essentially stimulation you have available is, is you're looking at this keynote talk. And if they're a compelling speaker, you're going to be staring at them for half an hour, an hour, or longer. Um, when we shift to virtual, we are now in an entirely different environment. They are sitting, uh, A, they're sitting most of the time at home. And so there's all the distractions of our personal life. We might have kids running through with Nerf guns. Uh, we've all seen some really funny experiences on, on virtual calls like that. Uh, so we're, we're directly competing for attention with, uh, with our personal lives. And then at the same time, you know, we're, we're also sitting at our workstations. We are literally we have our screen up watching this live event and right behind it are all the other windows, my, my email and my web browser to do my day-to-day -day work. So the competition for attention is, is much more aggressive than it would be in kind of this closed off environment. And so we're really encouraging our clients to think about interactivity and the dynamicism as much as possible. We can't get away with just doing a one-way linear keynote for 30 minutes or 60 minutes. We really need to find every excuse to involve our audiences in the experience throughout. And that's what's so great about technology if you embrace it. All these tools have fantastic features around interactivity. So we use Zoom most and I think a lot of companies do, but all, many of the other tools have similar features where you can do um, interactivity through the icons in the, in the little chat deal. You can actually do in the chat, of course. And then I'm a huge fan of polling um, to be able to do to do questions. And then one thing we like to do to take it to the next level is actually create slideshows that can be navigated in a modular way, in a uh, kind of choose your adventure type of way based on what the audience is telling you. And so if they're interested in a certain part of your business, uh, you can navigate to slides that address that and not just try to do this 
hey, I've got 50 slides and we are going to power through no matter what you do. Uh, really trying to change that mentality around focusing on the audience interests and uh, making it as interactive as an experience as possible. I'm going to unpack what I think I just heard you say and feed it back. I want you to clean it up, and, you know, but but I think there's 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 several hooks in here for folks that may, whether they're picking this up live, they pick up the replay. Um, I want them to benefit from this. What I'm I think I'm hearing you say is, traditionally you might have done a linear approach, so from A to Z in your presentation, you know, with a slide that progresses, kind of like we would read a book moving forward but you use the words you know choose your own adventure book where you might actually be creating three or even four essentially you know presentations or powerpoints within the structure and you're prepared to go right go left go straight or maybe even back up and take a different course depending on the engagement with your audience uh, is that is that sort of how you're helping your speakers plan for these events yes you you articulated it well there and just to kind of then continue the thread um, in thinking of kind of a traditional presentation structure you know a lot of times the, the most common one you'll see is you have your intro you have your conclusion and then you have section one two and three like that's the one of the most common ones you'll see as far as a presentation structure and what we're proposing is instead of section one two and three think of it as section cat dog rabbit as in it's it's sort of a, a order agnostic selection and you can strategize your content you have to do you have to think about it a little differently but instead of just automatically assuming the audience wants to hear about section one first um, use your intro to actually give a preview think of it like a movie trailer uh, give them a preview of what we can spend our time talking about and why not pause at the end of the intro and say cat and dog rabbit what what would you like to choose from here what's most re uh, what's most uh, interesting what resonates with you the most so yeah, it's, it's crafting it in a modular way. It's a subtle change. It doesn't require a significant amount of reworking, but it allows you to then create these opportunities for the audience to weigh in. Uh, and then when we do our kind of advanced level presentations, we have sales presentations that within each of those categories have tiers of information. So you've got tier one, which is just the quick hitting one minute version. If they want to keep going, you've got tier two, sometimes tier three. And so we can spend anywhere from two to three minutes on a section to two to three hours in some cases because we just have that depth of content all trying to focus on what does the audience care the most about and, and really trying to shift away from this idea of I'm just going to share everything to you um, in, in kind of one one sitting there. I love the creativity that people are finding in this new environment. I've seen use of new tools. Uh, I was on a Zoom the other day and they were using, I think it's called Mentimeter, which is a website where folks can submit um, sort of keywords and phrases in response to a speaker, which then creates a word cloud that was pulled up on screen and the speaker was, I think this is similar to what you're describing, was they could take words out of that word cloud and go a little bit deeper depending on what was really relevant to that specific group of people. But the creativity of the way folks are using you know, Zoom's been around. We, a lot of us have been using it for a while, but I'm seeing things I've never seen before in the last, you know, three, four months uh, in new ways of people really leveraging these tools, sometimes in a fun and playful way as well. Exactly. And, and this is something, it, the timing is interesting because we've been pushing these strategies well before virtual events and in person events too. We don't, I, I describe the typical kind of captive audience keynote. I still don't believe that we should treat Alkino with a captive audience as a linear experience either. And so there's tools like Slido, or many people are familiar with Poll Everywhere, where you've been able to do things like the word cloud you mentioned, or democratized Q&A where people can upvote a, a question from the audience and adding polls to live events. These are principles that really work in both an in-person context and a virtual context. It's just that now that we're all virtual, these tools are even easier to work because we're sitting right here at our workstation. I can easily click and, and make those adjustments on the fly the way it's not as quite as easy to do when I'm standing on stage. But yeah, it, the, the, the competition for attention is, is more fierce than ever. Again, I talked about we're competing with people's personal lives and we're also competing with their professional lives directly on the exact same workstation that they're trying to get their goals accomplished professionally. And so we have to make it especially compelling and engaging for them to justify spending their time listening to us.
All right. So I, I love that you brought up some of these other apps. Uh, I'm not familiar with Slido. Like I get nerdy about about the because <laughs> it's just fun to play with these different toys. So that will be a fun uh, diversion. We won't get we won't go deeper now. What I want to cover a last well, as we start on, on yeah. Slido, um, they've been using it at South by Southwest for the last four or five years. And one of the most compelling sessions I ever went to was an Elon Musk Q&A. And the entire session was facilitated by this democratized Q&A process. So everyone, submit, it's just a little web app. You submit your questions on the phone. Everyone else in the audience can see those questions. And so you can um, choose the ones that you like the best. And, and then he just answered them in the order of the ones that were heading to the top. And so it really gets away from this. We've all been there where some guy just kind of hustles to the microphone and asks a question so specific to his situation <laughs> right. that it's, it's completely irrelevant to everyone else. And they take maybe one or two or three questions and then they're off stage and it's just such a wasted opportunity. And I, I was talking about Slido and how I love that aspect of it because it's very similar, for example, Reddit, if folks are Reddit users out there, um, that voting up uh, of, you know, it floats to the top. What is going to be most relevant to this group? It, you, one person can't dominate just because they got seated in the front row or they got to the mic first or they raised their hand or they jumped up and down, annoyingly jumped up and down in front of you when, you know, your question would have been more valuable to everyone in the audience. So. So I love the, that. I'm definitely going to dig into that a little bit more. Right now, what I want, I want before we finish up, I want to talk about there's someone out there that is the right fit for you, for your team at Puffingston. How would they know? What, what would they be thinking about and the questions they would be asking themselves to, to let them know this is a good conversation to have with Luke and the team? Yeah. You know, uh, sales presentations, templates, all of those are... are uh presentations that affect a company in so many ways. Sales presentations are probably used hundreds if not thousands of times. Templates are used thousands if not tens of thousands of times a year uh, by your company throughout the throughout the uh, organization. So yeah, those are the ones we tend to work with a lot of tech companies, but of course tech permeates uh, practically all sectors too. Make sure you check out puffingstonpresentations.com and uh, we certainly want to make sure uh, you get a chance to connect with Luke and the team. If nothing else, look at the work that they're doing and why people seek them out for when the presentations really matter and the stakes are high.